I grew up in Czechoslovakia. I went to school there and lived there through my teens. In Prague, in the city, in the center of the heart of the city, in the old city. I was an only child. My father died before the war, so that was just my mother and me. Oh, I had two girl cousins that, you know, we had one, this, we lived in a city and we had an apartment upstairs and these two girls had, and this was my mother's brother and his wife, and these two girls lived downstairs and they were practically my sisters, you know, we did everything together. I more or less lived with them and they didn't come back. They were younger than I was. And uh, I had kind of a high school sweetheart, a boyfriend whom I had had for five years, uh, six years by the time I went to camp. And, he was a highly gifted individual, musical and uh, academically, and he uh, did everything. He didn't come back. Those were the things that hurt is my, you know, personal. Of course, my mother never got over the loss of her siblings. She really didn't. I'm not aware of there being much discrimination against Jews before the war. It was pretty open and integrated society. I remember some Cat calling of names on the street once, but in my I was in a public school and uh, was large Jewish minority there. And there was an influx of German immigrants, and they kind of brought the fear with them. Which uh, until until thirty nine, Czechs were saying, "Oh, it's not going to happen here. Nothing is going to happen here. We are safe. We are right." And we still were kidding ourselves that it's safe. But then in the Germans marched in on March 15, 39. That was kind of a sh shock to the system. I rem remember that day very vividly. I, I don't know why. I went to the post office and it was sleeting. And on the corner of the street, there was standing a, uh, a Czech policeman directing traffic and the German soldier next to him who took over. And the Czech policeman stood there and he didn't know what to do because uh, the German had taken over directing the traffic. And it was kind of a really plastic illustration of a conflict of power, the two of them standing there and the German taking over. We had had no warning at all. My mother started talking about emigration and took me out of the public school and put me into a private language school because she wanted me to learn English fast. And uh, so, and afterwards I was kind of apprenticed in a trade because I was supposed to have something I could do when I came over to wherever we were going. And then first the public schools were closed. To, we weren't allowed into public schools, then we weren't allowed into restaurants, then we weren't allowed into parks, then we weren't allowed into schools. Then the, this little workshop I was working was you had to have special restrooms for Jews and of course this was like a workshop for 10 people and this was impossible for him, the man, to comply with this kind of demand. So he had to let me go. So by that time, I was realizing that things were different for me. October 42, we were called up by a notice to appear in the fairgrounds. There was a fair the grounds there in building, a big building, covered building, and to assemble for a transport. My mother and I went from Prague to Theresienstadt in Czechoslovakia, and that was still within Czechoslovakia. And I guess we were lucky that we stayed there for two years. And uh, I was working and my mother was working and we had extra rations, so we did, we, li we lived okay. We also had a couple of parcels from home from some family that were not Jewish. In a room about the size of this one, let's say 12, it could have been a little bigger, 12 by 8, 18, it was longer. We were in three layered bunks and there were 35 people in that room. It was a little old house and there was, the bathrooms were the horror. There was just two kind of outhouses on the, in the hallway to serve the whole house that was equally full. And one year the Red Cross Commission came and they emptied out all the rooms that were at street level, you know, and put one couple in each room and moved every 35 people relatively, depending on the size of the room, out and just jammed us up more so that they should, could show the Red Cross how humane this place was. No, I mean, they were flanked by, by Germans and, you know, escorted through and shown around. And the streets they were taken through had been cleaned up and the houses painted. And in the ground floor level, there was one couple in each room and they showed the Red Cross this lovely um, 
settlement that was so clean and nice. They were never left by the Germans, so there was no way to get to them. I must say, you know, that while I and my mother, we were both young and healthy at the time, we were quite comfortable. A lot of people died in the, just from undernourishment and stress, and uh, especially the older people. I mean, the amount of food that seemed to be sufficient for me or my mother, also we had some extras. The old people died, I mean, in the hundreds and thousands. Well, there was a call up again. It was 2,658 people, I know, because I was in the last carriage and this was numbered and everybody was counted. And uh, we were in cattle wagons. They were covered at that time. I mean, they, were, they had slats, but there was a roof over them. And this was in October 44. And we went to Auschwitz. It took two days, 48 hours or better to get there. Well, we had two buckets, one with water and one for other needs. And there were two children in the car with us, one like a four-year-old and a six-year-old. And then there was an infant in the car. And those kids were so good, it was absolutely amazing. Uh, I, I don't know, it was... I suppose I managed to really kind of insulate myself and say I, I wasn't really participating in all that. I built a wall around me and said that's not happening to me. I, it can't be true and I'm not participating in this. And I just really shut myself off. And that's how I went through the whole war. And then when we arrived in Auschwitz in the evening, we could see this rather ghostly landscape with flash uh, floodlights on the barbed wire, which went on for miles and miles and miles, and that all you could see. I just remember when we got out of the train in Auschwitz that we were being separated right on the platform as you stepped out of the train and sent left and right. And they wanted to separate me and my mother, and my mother said, we are mother and daughter, leave us together. So he motioned us to one side together. We heard that whoever wasn't with us, there was 200 women where we were in the morning, was dead. They all had gone straight to the gas oven. 2,456 people. We were told right the minute we were separated and sent over to that one side that this was all that was left of the train load of people. And amongst this group was my girlfriend, whose mother had gone to the other side, and was my gym teacher, whose children had been sent to the other side. That was the first time I ever heard about gas chambers. I mean, it was just too big and too shocking to absorb. My mother started crying, but I still somehow refused to believe it. I just didn't, I suppose, in a way she knew that she had just narrowly escaped. But uh, I just, it was too monstrous, too big. It was unbelievable. There was a very famous clarinetist with us too in the train, and he had an eye infection. He wore dark glasses. so. He went to the gas. Well, they kept us in that one hall, which was cement floors and nothing else all day. And afterwards, they asked us to strip, and we were shaved. I mean, heads and body was sh shaved, and we were herded through past soldiers. And now I was like 13 or 14, and I was walking na naked past soldiers all the time, which really was, after the first day or so, you get used to it. <laughs> but. Um, and then we were herded into a bathhouse with overhead showers. By that time, we knew that the gas chambers were dressed up as shower rooms, and we decided there were holes in the windows, the glass was broken, this wasn't a gas chamber. So that's... Um, and then we were herded into barracks. Barracks were long, big, wooden kind of quonset huts with, with um, planks where people would... We were lying six on one plank, and when one person wanted to turn, we had six of us to turn because there wasn't any room for anything else. The worst part for me at the time was we had, we had roll call every morning. This was in Poland in October, and Poland in October is cold, and we didn't have much clothes. They had issues us. They didn't issue us in uniforms. Uniforms are solid and protective. We had just been given old rags, and we would stand on roll call from six o'clock in the morning till 11 o'clock at noon or something like that until every head in the camp was accounted for and this was like hundred thousand and the roll call would never work and they come back and count again and and in the evening again this was way before dark till way into daylight and in the evening again for three four five hours we would be standing for roll call and for the first three or four days in auschwitz we never got anything to eat 
after first day, somebody complained to one of the carpos and evidently we should have been issued rations which hadn't happened. So she got us some soup. That was the only food I got in six days in Auschwitz was one soup. We, we, we stayed together, the group of 200 of us who had been selected from the from that transport and we were all young, healthy people. I mean, we had been selected once over again when we were in the bathhouse, we had been selected naked, you know, that's too. And again, they wanted to send my mother off and, they, and then they asked her whether she had somebody there and she said she had a daughter, they let her pass. There were about three women at her age in the group. The rest of us was all very young. I actually was in Auschwitz only one week and then I was shipped off again. The last day we were standing outside from before dawn in the morning to dark at night, and I just didn't think I could stand anymore. It was really, my back was playing up, and we kind of huddled together and supported each other because we really couldn't stand. And I, then we were given a piece of bread and a piece of uh, margarine and a piece of salami for the trip, and there was, it was given to us like that, nothing to hold it in or keep it in. So the bread we kept, but the margarine and the meat I ate, and I got very sick, threw up immediately. And I also arrived in the camp in, in Germany. It was pretty high temperature. I had a reaction. And they had kind of, we were, well, the trip was quite something else again. This was now in, no, these were still cattle cars. These were still the open cars. I was beginning to doubt that I would make it because I simply couldn't stand anymore and I couldn't see how I was going to get out of this. And uh, uh, I guess I, by that time I already had the temperature. I was sick too. I arrived in Germany with, with a high 42 degrees, which I don't know what Celsius, which is quite a bit. It was a small factory and we had dry and heated um, sleeping quarters. That was a big advantage. They had had to ev evacuate this labor, uh, this work camp where we were in. This was April 45, and they returned us to the Theresienstadt. They had sent thousands and thousands of people from all parts of Germany back to Theresienstadt. Um, and as a matter of fact, that was the first time I saw these photographs. These, you know, you see these piles of corpses, the photographs of the pile of corpses. I think everybody has seen by now. But I think the much more horrible thing is to see these corpses walk. And that was for the first time I saw them. Walking into this typhoid and cholera ridden place was liberation for me. And uh, then they wanted us to stay there and we were healthy, you know, and the chances that we'd catch something there were really pretty good. So uh, we got Red Cross passes in there. We uh, joined a laundry cart that was taking laundry out of the camp and smuggled our way out of the camp and went back to Prague. We went into a hotel and we got two white beds with sheets and linens and blankets. And there was hot and warm and running water in the room. And it, I, I didn't know it could feel that way. And we both got sick. We both were in bed with a high temperature. And there was no public transport and nobody to call and no food. And so then we remembered somebody from the friends we had at the embassy. and. Uh, uh, with my temperature, I picked myself up and walked over there because my mother was sicker than I. And she gave us tea and toast. That was liberation. <laughs> the whole extent of what had happened didn't hit us till after the war. I mean, like out, out of my mother's family, out of... There's a, it's strange, there were 13 people in my mother's family. You know, she had, was married, four married sisters and two brothers with their daughters and sons and wives and husbands. Thirteen went into camp, nobody came back. And I had a group of young people we used to meet in Prague uh, just before camp's social group. And out of the, all my age and out of this group of thirteen, one came back. I just pushed it away. I decided I couldn't think about it. I couldn't cope with it. And I think it's no more than five years now that I can't even touch on it. And I really was so busy adjusting and repressing and living, and I just didn't want to. I never told anybody. I, when I met my husband, who was also from Czechoslovakia and spent his war years in, in Japanese camp, we did exchange information. But I think that's the only time I ever mentioned it. I never mentioned it to my children. They never, I, I never talked to them about it. They practically don't know that I was in a camp.
what stayed with me, the defensiveness, the not, not wanting to feel, not wanting to be involved. What I'm very aware now is, of course, the lack of family. Um, and I, that I have been always aware of. I mean, ever since I came to this country, I have this feeling of being a waif, <laughs> of being alone in the world, which I am. My husband lost his parents. He had one brother who has died since. Um, because my husband died and I have no family left.